Welcome to Regional Arts Australia's Artlands Conversation Series. My name is Mary Jane Warfield and I'm the Regional Arts Fund Manager with Regional Arts Australia. I'm joining you today from the Pontoa Alice Springs where I live and work. I'm on Arunda Country. Regional Arts Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of land throughout Australia and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm delighted to welcome you to the fourth session of our Artlands Conversation Series Beyond the Biennale. All of the Artlands programming is supported by the Australian Government's Regional Arts Fund. So firstly, a little bit of housekeeping. Today's session will be Auslan interpreted and closed captioning is available. If you wish to enlarge the view of the Auslan interpreter, please scroll over their video screen. On the right hand corner of the video panel, there's a drop down menu where you can select pin video. This will make that interpreter screen larger and there are two Auslan interpreters today, Alyssa, who you can see now, and Tanya. They will interpret for about 15 minutes each and then they'll swap over. So you'll need to pin each interpreter as for their larger screen. Along there, you should be able to see a Q&A button and a chat button. So please jump into the chat, say hello, and let us know where you're tuning in from today. And the Q&A is reserved for questions for the panelists. So I'll moderate those. Um, we really welcome your questions. You'll be able to see other people's questions and you can upvote them. There's a little thumbs up icon. Um, so you, if, you, if there's a question there that you relate to and you wanna see answered, then click the thumbs up and that'll push that question further to the top. Um, so we will have some time at the end to explore questions, but we probably won't get to all of them during the session. As I said, today's topic is beyond the Biennale. Regional Arts Australia would like to acknowledge the work of Gareth Hart. Uh, Gareth uh, proposed this topic in response to our original call for Artlands papers early in 2020 and has worked with our Executive Director, Ros Abercrombie, to develop the topic. So I just wanted to acknowledge their work and thank them. Thank you, Gareth. The Art Biennale model has seen a suite of ambitious works shown across regional Australia over the years. It is a model that has close ties with cultural tourism and is grounded in the presentation of ambitious work. However, the almost monolithic scale of these cultural events makes them resource intensive and poses a real risk to presenters. So now we witness a moment of being beyond this paradigm. We see a shift in the very nature of ambition in our regional cultural ecology. Ambition is embraced within practice itself, not necessarily within the scale or quantity of the work presented. So the panel today has been selected to bring three different visual arts voices together. An independent artist, Sean Harris, a curator from a regional gallery museum, Claire Armitage, and a director of a regional Biennale, Fiona Sweet. The focus of today's conversation is how contemporary practice is no longer simply placed in or responding to our regional landscapes, but instead it emerges from and resonates with place. The conversation will be facilitated by Sandy Collins. Sandy is the Artist Services Manager, Manager with Australia Council for the Arts. So more information about our, all of our speakers and panellists for the whole series is available on our website. And I'll now hand over to Sandy to facilitate the conversation. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, Mary Jane. Thank you very much. Lovely to see everybody. Um, welcome to the um, Artlands Conversation series number four entitled Beyond the Biennale, as the lovely Mary Jane um, has outlined. I'm Sandy Collins, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land on which I work and live, uh, the Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation here in Sydney, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. I am joined um, on the panel by three fabulous women, Sean Harris, Claire Armitage and Fiona Sweet, who uh, all work across regional geographies and in the contemporary visual arts space. Sean is a Gurnu Bakunji Nunku woman from Wilcannia in far west New South Wales. She's a contemporary Aboriginal artist whose body of work comes from the worldview of the Gurnu Bakunji Nunku perspective. Welcome, Sean. Claire Armitage has worked in public and private art galleries between 
Darwin and Catherine for the last nine years and is currently the Assistant Curator of Art at the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory. Okay. Uh, and lastly, but certainly not leastly, is Fiona Sweet. She is a prominent and highly respected arts director and curator and is the creative director of the Ballarat International Photo Biennale. Thank you and welcome everyone, welcome all the attendees. So this is a pretty big um, conversation beyond the Biennale. Um, we want to focus it in to how contemporary arts practice now really emerges from within our regional landscape rather than being placed in it or just responding to a particular regional landscape. I'd like to start with you, Sean, um, and it's a simple one. Can you tell us how your work emerges from your regional environment? Thank Please. you. Um, so I guess I'll start by explaining a little bit about um, where I'm based. So I'm on the New South Wales Victoria border um, and I live and work on country. So um, for me, the art and practice and narratives that I get to tell um, are very connected to country, are very connected to uh, where I find myself working, where I find myself living, um, and also just uh, belonging as well. So it's, it's very connected. Um, and I think a lot of that shines through in the narratives that I get to tell. So it's not like um, I know a lot of other artists who have had to move away, especially living in regional centres who've had to move away um, so that their practice and, and their work could be seen and appreciated by wider audiences. Um, I have the luxury of getting to stay where I am, work where I am, and still have that sense of belonging. And my work emerges from that close connection to uh, the local area. Thank you, Sean. It's interesting, the, um, the no borders kind of situation. That, yeah, that, that whilst you're on a border, but you feel that there's no border to you making your work and um, being uh, uh, well consumed by it, I suppose as well, uh, within the landscape that you're that you're in and the and the area that you that you live and work in, uh, which is I'm sure inspiring. Um, Claire, you're a um, curator and with broad experience across regional Australia and. I just want to ask you, you've got a, a, an academic background in, um, in, in this area. So what changes have you noticed in contemporary practice that, that comes from and resonates with regional environment? Maybe as a Territorian. Thanks, Sandy. And um, yeah, hi, everyone. And thanks for having me. It's lovely to be talking to you all. Um, Sandy, I'm sorry, can you just ask the end of that question again? I just lost the lost the thread a bit. Sorry, Sandy, you're still on mute. be the last time you will have to say that to me, I promise. Um, with your background, with your academic background, and also as a curator with broad experience across regional Australia, particularly um, uh, I'm thinking about the Catherine and Darwin area or the, the territory in general, have you noticed 
um, what or what changes have you have you seen over the last you know even if it's just recent um, in contemporary practice that that comes from the landscape and rather than being imposed upon it. Okay, thank you for um, for going through it again. Um, one of the one of the main things that I have observed working in um, a curatorial space over the last probably four or five years um, in the Northern Territory is a, I don't know if it's a, a sort of new thing or if it's like a reinvigoration of something that's already, al already and always been present, um, but an interest in in telling stories of artists that have worked in the past or that are working now, um, but telling those stories through exhibitions or, or workshops or other projects. Um, and those stories are kind of interested in uncovering, they're, they're like untold stories. They're things that have happened in parts of the Northern Territory that haven't been told before. And that might take the form of simply just telling the story of an artist through an exhibition whose work's never been kind of properly explored or celebrated in the way that it should have been. Or it might be far more complex than that um, and, and sort of embedded in, in history and some of the um, very, very terrible things that have happened historically in, in the Northern Territory, in, uh, the course of colonial contact, but I would I would say that's something that I'm aware of and something that really excites me as a curator is is working that way um, and working collaboratively with the inevitably kind of smaller communities that you end up working with in regional arts practice um, in the process of uncovering and and telling those stories that need to be told that perhaps, yeah, haven't been told in a fully realised way or have, have never been told before. Uh, Sean, I saw you nodding there and, and in our previous session, I just, maybe you could just riff on the storytelling aspect. I saw you nodding quite vigorously and I just want to, you know, if you'd like to add anything to that. Sure. Um, storytelling is uh, a very important part of a lot of Indigenous cultures around this country. And it's really great that Claire touched on um, how, you know, giving a platform to people whose story hasn't historically been told in a way that... Um, is truthful or was meaningful or um, sort of, yeah, gave somebody that voice to have their story heard. And I think with a lot of regional artists, if we're focusing on um, art of place and practice coming from, you know, specific places around the country, um, there are so many people who have their own individual stories to tell. But there's also this collective narrative that sometimes is difficult um, to discuss and it's sometimes difficult for audiences to see that, but ultimately it needs to be told. It's part of truth telling. And for me personally, that's something that I find uh, to be necessary in my own practice. Yeah. Thank you. We can touch back on a lot of these things as we go, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it going. Um, Fiona, this is, um, I'm, I'm jumping to another aspect of, of, the, of the themes that we're gonna be exploring. Um, the presentation of ambitious work and I don't know whether to put that in inverted commas or not, but anyway, the presentation of ambitious work and the connection to cultural tourism is, is something that we want to, um, and dare I say the word, unpack, but let's just say discuss. 
Um, just want to share, get your thoughts and observations on, on the kind of changing landscape of, of ambitious regional arts practice and its connection to cultural tourism um, from the aspect of your current role and in previous roles. Thank you, Sandy. And thank you everyone for inviting me to attend. Um, yes, as the director of a, a regional arts festival, which is a Biennale, so it's held every two years. I suppose that's one of the definitions of a Biennale. Um, I'm quite cognizant of, of considering the place that I live, which is Ballarat, which is Wadarung land. Um, I've only been in Ballarat for four and a half, nearly five years. So my impression of the city, the town, the community is of someone from outside looking in. Uh, and I think that has um, influenced in many ways the way I look at how a Biennale or let's be kind of simplistic, an arts event or a visual arts exhibition or a series of visual arts exhibitions can both inform the community that we live in, um, provide an incredible sense of pride for the community. And also the third part would be um, bringing often artists from outside of the community into the city so that um, artists and other members of Ballarat can actually see work that they would otherwise have to travel to see. So those three components are quite important um, in the way I direct the Biennale. And what that means is that rather than being sort of on top of the town and coming in once every two years to have a series of exhibitions, workshops, public programming and education every two years, I've made the decision to come and live here, learn more about the people who live here and actually extend the Biennale beyond the 60 days in the even year and actually try and develop projects over the two years or possibly over the four years so that we're engaging for a longer period of time in the thought processes and the, and the narratives of the artists so that by the time the Biennale is exhibited, we've actually had lots of dialogue with the artists, um, adapted, changed and resolved it. Curators come in and have those conversations with the artists as well. Our festival is very much driven by curators engaging with the artists. I prefer to have it that way. And then what happens is, is that when you end up with the Biennale in its presentation stage, it's actually had quite a significant series of projects, events, activities, and conversations. So um, I suppose that's quite contrary to how the Biennale was before I started, which was very much planning to which exhibitions were going to be on and then exhibiting them. So that model, I think, is quite passe and I don't think it reflects the needs and the drivers of a local community. I mean, Sandy, you touched briefly on economic, no, no, not economic, um, cultural tourism. Certainly um, having a festival within the city. Having a festival within the city means that um, the, there's a strong economic impact to the town. And that's something that we are also very proud of in that we can showcase the idea that arts, artists can actually have an impact um, economically on the city. And I think that's something that we should promote as artists, directors and curators more often than not to people who are not involved in our sector. So, um, yeah, so basically we, it, 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 it's, it is literally beyond the Biennale in the fact that you've got this engagement with the local community or in your off year or on year um, and it, I guess you, you're sort of promoting the space anyway, or well, all year round. So it's not just this one thing for two weeks every two years. Um, and 
following on from that, Claire, with that, with with the um, the the museum and gallery. I mean, with with, with in terms of cultural tourism, um, that would be a thing, really, in in Darwin. I would imagine with um, and. and what what are the you know are there are there more local people going to exhibitions and 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 um, you know what are the what are the sort of visitations? Yeah, cultural tourism is um, is absolutely a thing in the NT. I think yeah, the current government would would like it to be even more of a thing, um, which is fantastic in some ways. Although I do think it's something that needs to be really carefully thought about and, and managed sensitively and with, you know, the right kind of consultation and all of that. Um, I suppose the best example I can think of that happens in Darwin is, is sort of the month of August where you have the Darwin Festival, you have the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art Awards. You have the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair and a whole lot of satellite exhibitions and events that sort of go on in amongst that. Um, so in a normal um, non-pandemic world, that would attract an enormous number, that, that sort of suite of events would attract an enormous number of people to Darwin and tourism there is very dependent on the weather. So it's in the middle of the dry season. So it's a, a time when the numbers are greater anyway. Last year uh, being what it was, um, we certainly didn't have the same influx of um, interstate and, and overseas visitors. And in some ways that was hard for a lot of businesses, but in other ways um, in, in the cultural sector, it was really nice because it did give local audiences a chance to re-engage with their own scene, if you like, um, and, and the people who are creating visual arts and music and theatre and dance and, and all of that stuff right there in Darwin and they're people that the Darwin arts community know well. And it was sort of... Um, Felt like a very positive opportunity to for, for our arts community to sort of recognize our own beautiful creative spirits that you know have been making things for so long so yeah is that a good does that sort of answer your question mm, there we go um thank you that's great i i i think it would be uh, also a, a real sense of pride for local artists in the, in the community when there there isn't the 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 drivers of, of tourism tourism where 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 um you know making work for tourists right and then in way as you were saying they're you know telling stories and or making work for themselves for for their for the community basically and I would imagine that would be, you know, in gender, you know, pride in, in the community, which instead of outside looking in at, at their work, they're being able to present it to, the, to their peers. And yeah, absolutely, Sandy. And I think, yeah, that's sort of connected to this whole idea that we're talking about of, of work emanating from from place, from region, from community, rather than being um, superimposed on it in, in some way. John, in where you live, which as you say is on the border um, near Mildura, um, in terms of, we, we see a lot of uh, uh, this, again this concept of cultural tourism the regions um, are showing quite strong figures and there's a lot of advertising um, about getting and seeing your own re region staying in your own backyard you can't go overseas you can't do this you can't do that and and just um, uh, you know um, 
the, the sort of stats that are coming out of, of the uh, regional Australia Institute and, um, and anecdotally people are saying, oh, I went to, you know, Coonabarabran or I was in Wagga Wagga um, just recently, just last year because um, Art State had the conference there and it was just like, go, oh, great, you know, and we all just packed into Wagga Wagga and it was absolutely fantastic just to, and to see, again, artists from Wagga Wagga and the surrounding area uh, show their art to, the, you know, people that have never, you never get to see their stuff unless you are in that town. So where you are, um, is there uh, like a, a that kind of concept that you would promote? Um, you know, are there things like art trails and and, um, and are, are you, do you, is there any sort of um, uh, I don't know promotion with Destination New South Wales about pockets of artistic communities in in um, where you are or in um, regional New South Wales and regional Victoria. Um, I think, especially with regional Victoria, um, there is a lot of promotion. So Mildura sees a lot of tourism um, all year round, I would say, um, especially when we are having the arts events. A lot of people do come in from out of town. Um, it's really a tourist destination um, and has been for a long time now. Uh, because we're on the border, um, it's a little trickier on the New South Wales side. Um, so the Dead and Wentworth um, community, a lot of the promotion for the art scene comes out of Broken Hill, which is about 300 kilometres away. So mm -hmm. they, they do amazing, amazing stuff um, that far out west. And the New South Wales side of where I am does come under um, sort of their jurisdiction, I guess, with, you know, uh, whatever events or activities are going on. But we certainly don't get as much promotion um, and events on the New South Wales side than we do over in Victoria. Yeah. I understand. I won't comment on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just, it's um, yeah, it's a lot to do with, um, you know, local government boundaries, um, who is able to access funding and, yeah. So it's a little bit tricky. It's tricky being on the border, definitely. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is still around the, the, the cultural tourism kind of um, heading, if you like. Um, but from a, from, again, from a, from a uh, Northern Territories perspective, and we, we might have actually covered this off a little bit, but do you see a shift? in the nature of what an ambitious work is in our cultural ecology is sort of emanating from the territory? I mean, I, I do in the sense that I think, and I'm also sort of completely biased, but I do think that in, in the sense that for me, the work um, is, is gets better and better and the ideas get better and better. And as we, work in better ways together the different different communities that exist in the northern territory um then yeah i think they're not like the northern territory is just a really interesting it's a really interesting case study if you like being just this this very small number of regional and and remote um towns and cities um, and obviously a lot of people living on country outside of those places but 
um, yeah, you're just constantly, I guess, it, all, all parts of the sector, everyone's always navigating that distance and, and remaining connected and, um, and sharing what's happening in different parts, even of the Northern Territory. It's kind of like a, a model of the challenges that regional Australia or, or arts in regional Australia faces at large, just overcoming things like arbitrary borders, like Sean was saying, and distances and remaining connected. Um, so, yeah, I think it, I think that I've seen change and that I think the work that is being made is, is getting better and better across a whole lot of different art forms, but particularly um, in the visual arts, I think. Thank you. Fiona, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? On the nature of ambition and whether there's a shift in your time? I think, uh, mm, I think that, um, I mean, the notion of the large, big, almost ceremonial piece in a Biennale that takes up, you know, 60 or 70% of the budget, I think that sort of um, narrative is long gone, which I think is very good. Um, um, ha um, however, I suppose with my, you know, um, director's hat on, trying to get audiences from the city, so primarily Melbourne is where we get our audiences, 71% of our audiences come from Melbourne, to get them to come to a regional centre and experience the artists from the region, not just Ballarat, from the broader region of the west, western part of Victoria. Um, we often need to um, celebrate some significant, um, perhaps more important, you know, more well-known artists in order to have that, um, I suppose the expression is um, a rising tide floats all boats. So the idea that if you've got this thing, this energy coming along and you've got the momentum of getting people from the city to the regions through some, might I say, celebrity art projects, not that they are celebrity, but they might be slightly more well recognised, it allows those audiences, if we do it properly, it allows those audiences to engage with all the exhibitions that we have in all the different heritage buildings all over the city. And we often find through surveys that actually a lot of the exhibitions that they like the most are the smaller, more challenging, more thought provoking um, regional artists who are expressing something more about their place and their community. So um, with us, we don't have these enormous budgets to put on these very big um, uh, ex visual arts exhibitions. And so the, the, the breadth of our, of our program, there's nearly 160 exhibitions over 60 days, allows for all that intertwined kind of engagement with people coming to, to Ballarat. And we, you know, it's very important for us that we bring people to these exhibitions. It's, it's critical. I don't know if that answered your question, Sandy. It's all answering my questions. They're, they're more, they're not really questions. They're, I just want to, I just want to hear you talk. Basically all of you. Um, I, I think it's probably fair to say that we have, you know, I, I, I think Ballarat's what, uh, it's not that, it's only a couple of hours drive at, at, at from Melbourne, isn't it? If that. Yeah, it's not even an hour and a half. An hour and a half, there you go. Then well, you've got Darwin, which is actually a capital, but given where it is and its distance from other centres like Alice or Catherine or wherever, then that, that's a completely different situation. You're relying on, on people coming in as well. Um, and then, Sean, you're miles from both capitals, really, um, cl closer to Melbourne, but, but, um, but you know, Far away. I mean, if you're 300 clicks from Broken Hill, I mean, you're miles from from Sydney. So, so again, it, it's it's um, 
where are you drawing your, if you're ex exhibiting in Victoria, um, in regional galleries or uh, online? I'm just trying to get a sense of, I mean, Fiona and Claire have places, actual buildings, um, and you have your relationship with online or... Um, Just try to flesh yeah. out the, um, you know, how you, how you get your audience. I guess um, it's a lot about having access to, for, you know, places to show my work. Um, so it, for, and I know it's the case for a lot of artists um, who are in the regional centres. Uh, it was interesting that Fiona had mentioned um, having uh, like a, a big name sort of person or group that would come in and would be the, you know, the draw to bring everybody else in. Um, and then people who are less established get to have their work shown and their stories told. Uh, so for me, it's a lot about taking opportunities as they're presented. So, um, and in the climate that we're in now, there is a shift to doing a lot of your work and presenting a lot of it online. Um, reaching different audiences. Uh, but in saying that, because we as regional artists feel connected to where we are, you know, ultimately we want to be able to have our work shown where we are. And yeah, so a lot of it for me is about having um, galleries that are willing to show our work. Um, if we were talking about, uh, you know, sort of building building that identity around regional arts. Uh, who are the people who say yes to whose stories are being told and whose work is being shown? So for me, it's a lot about, um, you know, decolonising spaces so that we, we can involve Indigenous artists more in the decision-making and the the discussions, the, and even as, you know, as talent, as artists who, who are going to be shown. So it's a lot, there's, it's a little difficult when, um, yeah, you are still, when you're not someone who's an established artist that everybody knows and who all of the tourists are coming to see. So even though the platform's changed a little, there are still a lot of us who are working on the ground to get our stuff out there and shown locally. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, I, I um, it, we, when you we're talking about access, participation, I'm actually gonna get to that in a tick. I didn't realize how much time had passed, but you know, natter about all this all day, quite frankly. But anyway, I'll keep moving it along. Um, it's very interesting what you're saying about the online thing. You actually want, you want a bit, and you also, you want the, the connection with your work in art space. I think it, it's, it's um, uh, I think it's really important, and 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 I think in these pandemic times, everyone's going well, to whack it online, whack it online, whack it online, and with forgetting that it that's a it's a it's 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 um you know you want you want you want to touch it with your eyes if you if you know what I mean I I, I think you don't you don't want necessarily to just look at some flat image on, um, on online, but that's actually what how we all have to do it or listen to it, music or, or whatever. And, you know, let's pray these, you know, we're, we're all coming out of this particular situation. Um, I've got, we, we would, we, I wanna talk about access, participation and, in, and engagement. Um, and and maybe and sort of going forward 
So the new ways to create and to present um, new work and experiences and, um, you know, new models. Um, so, Sean, I'll stay with you. What would, what would you like to see beyond the Biennale? Um, I guess, yeah, I would just like to see more inclusion of a different, like a wider variety of artists, um, which means that there are, is a variety and diversity in the stories that are being told um, and the work that's being presented. If we look at the panel now, um, we're all women. So yeah, in, in some spaces, um, there's not a lot of diversity with who is, you know, taking the stage, who's having that platform. So for me, I, I would like to see a wider variety um, of artists and narratives. A, a slight aside, but are you are, are you a peer, an Australia Council peer? Oh, so are you speaking to me, Sam? Are you an Australia Council peer? Do you assess for us? No. Okay, well, I'm going <laughs> to be contacting you <laughs> after the show and then you, you have, yeah, okay, if I can, if you don't mind. Sorry. Okay. Um, um Fiona in your we're staying on access participation and engagement and you've talked about um engagement and a little bit of um participation as well but you've got experience with uh, other models overseas as as well not but how would you um I mean what do you want to see in, in terms of the, how you're um, uh, directing the, your, your own Biennale, but also in, in, in all the other work that you do? I suppose um, I'm really keen to see more regional communities, not necessarily cities, not even necessarily towns, but I'm certainly really interested to see and help support other regional cities, towns and communities to create, let's call it a Biennale or let's call it an arts festival. I don't really mind what we call it. But um, when I was overseas on a grant in 2018, uh, part of the exploration that I was doing was looking at arts festivals. They were specifically Biennales, but let's just call them visual arts festivals in large cities and in small towns as well. And I wanted to see how communities engaged and it was really evident that although the larger big cities like Hamburg and Berlin and um, Paris and London had the money behind them to have these very very big shows they were less significant they were much less significant to the community because they were one of many projects that were happening within the city this is all pre-COVID of course COVID's changed a lot and when I went to small cities, I found that the engagement within the community was really, really strong. The percentage of audiences that were from the local community were much higher. The, the, the notion of wandering through a town or a, or a, or a landscape by, by audiences was just, you know, really part of the experience. So that when it comes to what Sean's talking about, which is engagement with artists, there was so much more of that because you weren't just engaging with the physical art, but you're engaging with the community or the landscape that that artist comes from. And I think Darwin, you know, being, I know it's a city, but being very much an identifiable region would have a very similar effect in terms of those kinds of festivals. I know Darwin Festival particularly. So, um, so interestingly during COVID, which there's a few messages in the chat about COVID. I have many peers who are directors 
of festivals, photographic, this is specifically photographic around the world. And yes, Sean, they're mainly women, which is very interesting. <laughs> um, and they they completely pivoted last year and um, particularly Singapore and Kyoto in Japan, they very much changed their programming because they were only going to have local um, audiences to actually shine a light on their local communities. So these were actually big cities that changed or pivoted completely from, from an international uh, representation of what photography is today in their cities and showcasing that to their communities and encouraging tourism, they actually just focused internally on their own environment. And they were quite surprised at the number of local audiences who had never been before, but who were captivated and inspired by the stories that were being told by their communities. Thank you. And we've just got a couple of little minutes left. So Claire, what, what do you want to see or, or how do you feel that we're coming through this um, particular period and whether, we're, it, you know, we, we clearly don't want to go back to these big, you know, un, uh, you know expensive extravaganzas basically? Yeah. Um, one of the things that... Um that happened at uh, the Museum and Art Gallery NT last year was that we developed a, a online version of NATSIA, of the, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Art Awards, as well as putting on the physical exhibition, um, which was a really interesting process in and of itself. But because um, all of the finalists, I mean, almost all of the 60 finalists in that show weren't able to travel to Darwin to um, participate in the award ceremony or any public programs in the way that they normally would. All of their, all of their presence and their voice went into the online version of the exhibition. And Ultimately, the, the artists who won awards um, were filmed by family members or people in art centres where they work on their own country, accepting their, uh, their prizes. And um, in some ways, it was sort of like the most heartfelt. I've been to uh, like a, quite a few um, Nazi award ceremonies over the years. And in some ways, it was sort of like the best one um, or there was like this emotional depth to it that, that the others didn't have. And the point of what I'm trying to say um, is that there's perhaps some balance moving forward. There's perhaps some balance we might be able to strike between, I mean, those people weren't physically able to come from the places that they live for various reasons but because they were able to stay where they live and express themselves um, in relation to this project because of technology, you did in some way as an audience member get some experience of that place as well as the Darwin Nazia place, as well as the diversity of, of this national picture. Um, so perhaps, yeah, there's, there's a way of of learning from how we've integrated so many things in the last 12 months, how we've, we've figured out so well in so many instances, how to integrate so many things that we can continue to, yeah, to think about how to do that and, and that that, you know, potentially gets better. I think that the term is the hybrid model, perhaps. Thank you. Um, we're, did, would any of you like to say anything else that I may or may not not have touched on? Because we're we're right on time for the Q and A, which um, the lovely Mary Jane is going to um, curate for us. But thank you very much. We've really I've really appreciated that. I humbly appreciate it. So thank you. And I guess we'll 
Mary Jane, if you want to sure. drive the bus home. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Sandy, Fiona, Sean and Claire. It's been really informative and lots of different topics, sort of lots of bits and pieces that I, I'm now wanting to um, see if we can get some conclusion. I don't you know, I mean, it's a big topic, so let's see. I've got two questions that I want to merge into one, and it's about community and location. So I'll read it out, and then, um, Sandy, maybe you can help me work out um, who we should go to about this or if anyone wants to um, volunteer. Yep. Yep. So this was the first question that came through from Kuweni. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Um, how do you manage telling the uncomfortable truth without upsetting the community? And this came through when... Sean was talking about sharing stories. So that's that's one part of the question. So how do you manage telling the uncomfortable truth without upsetting the community? And the other part of the question I'd like to add to that comes from Alana Hunt. Um, Alana's in WA. I'd love to hear some of the panellists about their most memorable experiences having challenging yet important conversations about their own locale, I think, you know, place within their own locale. What was difficult? What worked? What did you learn? So it's the two big and challenges. Sandy, yeah. what do you reckon? I, I well, um, I'd like to. Um, yeah, Fiona had a hand up, but I also the the uncomfortability question. Um, I'd, I'd like all three of, of of our panel to because I'm sure they have a different perspective. Yeah. Um, so Fiona, you you very politely put your hand up. So go you. Sorry. Sorry, everyone. I just couldn't find the button. Um, I spoke earlier about being um, new to Ballarat and, of course, there's, there was a huge um, inquiry and um, shame about um, uh, abuse of young children, particularly in institutions in Ballarat. And so when I came to this um, town, I really wanted to know more about it from the perspective of the community. So I spent quite a bit of time trying to nut out what was going on. And there was a lot of silence and there was sad people shuffling around the streets during the day who would always go to the same coffee shop to share their experiences uh, as um, survivors. Many of their friends did not survive and took their own lives. And this continued. And I thought in 2017 for my first festival, I would definitely do something about that but I found I didn't really have enough information. So in 2019, I did an exhibition of, about children in churches. So it wasn't about abuse of children in churches. It was just about the role of society and how it informs the lives of children. And I put them into two churches. Uh, both of them were Anglican. One was Lauren Grenfield, who talks very much about sort of, in a way, the abuse of children in America, kind of overeating, overindulging, kind of almost over adulting children, which is a very interesting exhibition. And many people cried in that exhibition and found that it was really quite traumatic for them. Again, it was not specific, but it was about place and it was about the narrative of the city. Of the city. Um, so I, I really enjoyed putting that on. I felt that it was important for me to tell, for, for me to sort of, say in a way that was not um, too specific, but it was actually very, very clear to the local community, particularly to the parishioners, who actually unfortunately needed counselling after the exhibition, um, which the priest gave them. So I think I'll leave my, oh, that's, that's it for me. Both parts of, the, of, of that question, because um, Sean, do you want to add to that? Um, so just uh, speaking about work that broaches uncomfortable, sort of unsettling, upsetting uh, narratives, for me, the way that I navigate the difficult um, truths that need to be told, uh, like in the introduction that you gave about me, it is coming from my worldview. So, um, while there have been a lot of horrible things that have happened in community, you know, across the country, I can only speak 
to it from my own personal um, worldview. It's just the things that have happened to me or from the worldview of a Gurnavakinji woman. Um, so I, a lot of my work focuses on um, dismantling the white male gaze, especially as it pertains to Indigenous uh, Black women um, and looking at our representations, um, how our voices are rarely um, heard, but we were, you know, collected and studied and um, a lot of the settler artwork that, you know, was coming out years and years and years ago was from the white, white male gates. Um, a lot of my work seeks to reclaim our voice and um, puts perspectives and representations of Indigenous women, but from my point of view. Um, so that's sort of how I navigate the upsetting and difficult truths that need to be told. Um, I, I put it on myself. If it upsets somebody, um, that's a, a them issue. I, I'm here to uh, tell my story, give my narrative, and um, I, you know, take it on the chin. If, if there's backlash, that's fair enough. But for me, it's art is about pushing boundaries. It's about, um, you know, not having these sanitized views of what other people think Aboriginal women are, who we are. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, it's a, it, I think that they're, they're two very powerful examples of, of, of work that might be uncomfortable for the viewer. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna make any further comments on that, but do, does that answer Alana's second part of the question, Mary Jane, in terms of being in, in exhibiting or, or what have you in your locale it was that was it was that the um not exactly but really important really important words there from Sean and Fiona so thank you for sharing those I think that really answers that first part of the question around um things that might be difficult for community or how do you how do you expose work that might pull examples so the other part of the question um is around uh it, challenging conversations about place, in place, and maybe this could, uh, sometimes this is to do with environmental or um, it can be tricky with um, with topics where you're talking to people who aren't necessarily versed in the arts, and I think that's what Alana's um, pointing towards. Mm. Um, so, so maybe we're talking, yeah, okay. Um, Claire, so given that you've got a bit of a mixed kind of audience from a tourism point of view, and, and obviously the, 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 it's a capital city and what have you, and you were talking about untold stories, have, have you got a, an example of, of, um, of that? Is um, it well, I, to, to yeah, I, I, I do. I suppose um, I just wanted to say just with Alana's question, which I think is a really good question, and it makes me think about um, the time that I spent living in Catherine and the really um, the, the unique kind of experience you can have in small communities in Australia where there aren't enough people around to insulate yourself with like-minded souls all the time and and you often come up against and interact with and talk to and you know you can have these sort of unlikely friendships with people who have very different opinions um, about all different kinds of things and that was certainly something that I that I experienced in the years that I was in Catherine um, and had a lot of because of um, having to live in such close physical proximity um, and there's sort of no like degrees of social separation, I found I was actually able to have conversations with people who 
um, think some things that I don't agree with and actually ask them why they think those things. And um, they often had, yeah, life experience that had led them to form particular worldviews. Um, and that was, that was really interesting for me and challenging um, to my kind of ethical and professional values and principles, things like tolerance and when you call someone out for something you think is wrong and then when you find out why someone thinks the thing that they think and then you have understanding for them and what that does to all of those boundaries. Um, so, yeah, without sort of going into the specifics of those conversations that I had because I feel a bit um, uncomfortable doing that, I certainly had those those experiences um, in in Catherine and I've had them to a lesser extent in Darwin. Um, and I suppose I learnt that, yeah, the, the best thing you, you can do is try and, and listen to people if you can find a way to understand what's going on for someone. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to sum that up, but it's something about those things. Thank you so much. That's, um, um, it's very powerful and um, that's what um, artists do best, tell a story and they're making someone feel a bit uncomfortable along the way, yay you. Um, and you know, keep the conversations going. I, I'm not meant to be talking anymore, am I, Mary Jane? No, that's all right. We've just we've gone a couple of minutes over, so I'm not sure if everyone would still be with us. But we will have this available as a recording. Um, so that usually goes up on our website within a matter of days. Um, so people can catch the rest there if they've had to tune out. I just wanted to take the thank you all very much it was huge as well as beyond the biennale and um, thanks so much for sharing and um, it felt really genuine and um, we really appreciate it and so we'll wave goodbye to all our um, people who've tuned in and thanks for coming and if the panelists could stay on the line please <laughs>